Well, hello, uh, author D to D Spotlight from Draft to Digital, and today we're actually going to be chatting with. Uh, well, he's he's become very well known online. I consider this man to be part of the neural transmitting network of the uh, indie author space online and elsewhere. So I'm talking to Nate Hoffelder, who is also the creator. He's a blogger. He's a, t a tech guru, web guru. He's the creator of the Digital Reader. And welcome to the show today, sir. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Now, uh, you and I have uh, been roughly connected over the years. I think it's the first time you and I have actually spoken face to face. So mm -hmm. it's nice to see you. Yeah, we were probably going to meet <laughs> at the Career Author Summit um, later this month, but then it got went online. Were you going to go? Yeah. Or? I don't. I don't know. I think so. That sounds vaguely familiar. But then it's one of many uh like conference casualties i've suffered over the over the past couple of months so who knows <laughs> I, think, I think d2d was listed as one of the speakers so it may have been dan who was speaking then yeah it might have been dan that is speaking we we're all interchangeable at draft to digital just plug we even swap beards every now and then so mm -hmm. um so your time yeah, when i when i reached out to you the topic you pitched is something I am really interested in, and it's something that I, I know a lot of authors maybe don't even think of some of the time. Uh, but you wanted to, to talk about how first how to refresh an author website, but that that does sort of assume that authors have websites. How important is an author website? Well, I don't know if it's really useful for selling a um, for say directly selling books. But I think it's good for you know building an author's career. It I think it's an essential part of their platform, yeah. because um, you can't, for example, to give you one example, you can't be invited to a book fair, or you or you can't be probably won't be accepted to book fair without being without the host look, looking over your website and seeing if you're serious and seeing if you know what to talk about, yeah. and. Um, you can't. For, one thing I just realized is that you can't get. It's going to be hard if you get, say, speaking gigs, which again invites public events. If you don't have a speaking gig page on your website. Yeah. Yeah. I just added that recently on mine. That's and, something I've had one in the past, but I think right now it's it's kind of sort of buried. So I probably yeah. need to make that more live. What's the what would be a, a good approach there? Uh, for adding a speaker page, like how how should you present that kind of thing? Um, on mine, I have well, hey, I like to speak. Here's at the bottom of the pages. Here's where I have spoken before, and, and here's the podcast I've been on. And then in the middle, it's here are the things I could talk about in a live stream if we yeah. wanted to do an interview. And then at the top, it's uh, here's a list of things I could talk about in, at a conference. Just okay. And um, well, both just. Um, topic areas and specific titles for presentations. Do you so, have a way for people to book you straight from that page for, for a conference or something? Not yet, but I should probably add that. Okay. Or, <laughs> well, we found a way to refresh your page. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just added a, about a month ago myself because I was looking over someone else's site and discovered yeah. that I didn't have it. And so, hmm? Yeah, and I think that's probably that's probably one of those rules of thumb uh, to figure out what what kind of content should be on your author page is just look at the pages of other authors, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so are there some like uh, best practices when it comes to an author's website? <clears throat> well, I think you should start with the homepage and try to, well, the very first step is what, what do you want your visitors to do? And then you start with the homepage and you put that at the top of your homepage. Yeah. Um, for most people, it's um, asking the visitor to sign up for their mailing list. Yeah, and that's always a good choice. Yours, yeah. for example, has your your book at the top. Yeah, which I I do, and I do ask people to sign up. I have a pop up, uh, which mm. I know is controversial. Where do you stand on the pop up? Well, it's. <laughs> I know people who yell at me about mine, but yeah. um, I, it works. It and, does work, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things. It's like uh, everyone kind of hates them, uh, but they're, they're around and they exist because they work. <laughs> so it's sort of uh, trying to balance on the edge of a knife there. You know, you don't want to anger anybody when they come to your website per, per se, but then, you know, 
that thing serves yeah, and, a, purpose, a purpose. And it can actually anger people. There's one person that I really do not like because his <laughs> pop up. I mean, I I jokingly say that I've don't name names. Let's not name names. Okay, I <laughs> but I just his pop up covers the entire screen, and you can't do anything until you X out of his pop up, and it's just it's just so very annoying. Yeah, yeah. And the guy's supposed to be a, uh, an expert in engagement, and uh, he's supposed to. He's supposed to be one of the experts in you know growing your audience, yeah. And that's what he has on his homepage. And I mean, it, it, every time I accidentally end up there, it, it pisses me off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is it about? Is it just that it takes up the whole page? Um, it takes up the whole page, and the exit button is a passive aggressive statement like, "No, I don't want to grow my audience." Yeah, so, I do. Yeah, I get that. That that does sort of annoy me too when they when they sort of use those like. You know, little psychological uh, tactics to try to, you know, give you a little guilt trip if you want out, you know. <laughs> mm. What would be a better approach? I just, my pop-ups are, well, they do tend to pop up, but you can just click uh, beside them or anywhere to make them go away. So, yeah, yeah. They're not, they don't take up the whole screen. Yeah, I'm waiting for somebody to throw one out there that has like a moving exit button. Like every time you get near it, it just sort of darts to the other side. <laughs> oh, New York Times had one actually. Yeah. There's they have, they messed up on how they programmed it, and so you try to click the button and it moved. Yeah, yeah. Now New York, now they have a strategy. This has become very popular with the large format uh, uh, publications like New York Times and Washington Post. I believe does this too, but like you can't even see. Like they'll show you like a quarter of a second of the content that you clicked over for, and then they interrupt to get you to either sign up with a with a free account where they can spam you, uh, or uh, pay for a subscription. Mm -hmm. Not my favorite approach, but I kind of get what they're going for. The Washington Post is the worst. Um, I can't actually read anything on their site because. Well, I went the first time I visit, uh, they get they get upset because I have an ad blocker, and so they won't let me see anything tied to right. at all. Right. And then after about the after I meet my that what's frustrating about this is that that counts as part of my quota for the free articles every month. Right. And so when I run out of the quota, I then get the set up. Uh, you've run you finish your quota, and why don't you go ahead and um, sign up? And yet yeah. I haven't actually read anything on their site at all. Doesn't that seem counterintuitive to a content yeah. provider? Uh, for a content provider, like what what can authors learn from from that strategy, <laughs> if anything? I don't know. If, I don't know if there's anything going on other than trying not to be quite so, you know, you know, demanding. But yeah, yeah. But at the same time, we do want people to, you know, there it is a little. There are some similarities there, I think, because, you know, we want people to to come to our sites and, and stick around uh, and hopefully buy something. But if we are a little too diligent in, in trying to protect our intellectual property, I guess, maybe uh, we can go overboard. Mm -hmm. Is that something you experience? Um, well, I tend to... I try not to, but yeah, I have the same reaction most authors do. Like if I see yeah. them, my stuff's being reposted, so I, I try to you know keep that under control. But it does annoy me. So, yeah, what's a what's the proper way to do a repost? Because you know we're in a community that likes to share our content, uh, and sometimes we we don't mean to violate anyone's you know IP or intellectual property rights. Uh, but there, you know, how do you properly share something? Do you mean on the social media or on a, a blog post? Well, let's say that I have a blog of my own and I want to share uh, a piece of content that you've written. What what uh, what would be the appropriate way to do that? I, like to, I, I what I try to do is um, share a link, and give people in, a reason to go visit the second article, yeah, the one I'm linking to, mm -hmm. an explanation or something. Yeah. So instead of wholesale sharing the whole thing, you share maybe a snippet or you write your own synopsis of it and then link to it or a commentary on it. Yeah. And so how effective are blogs right now? Cause I kind of hear a lot of back and forth on whether or not they're even worthwhile anymore. Um, well, my feelings are mixed. 
I was getting most of my customers from you know meeting them at events and speaking yeah. at events or having a table at an event. But with you know with everyone being at home now, I think blogs might begin might start to be effective again. But even so, with blogs, I th I tend to think it'd be better to you know blog on Twitter and Facebook instead, or blog wherever you hang out online. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. would you write long format comment? Or are you just talking about? Because like on Twitter, of course, you can do the um, the the threads, and then there's the you know what the, it's called unrolling. I think when they can mm -hmm. or un. I don't remember what it's called, but where you can unroll that thread or bundle it into one long post, basically, and share that. Is that kind of what you mean? Well, what I've taken to doing is um, writing my the draft of my blog post on Facebook, mm. and then I copy it over to Twitter, so it's a chain, and yeah. then um, I publish them, and then a few days later, I uh, will pu publish it on my blog, so I have a more permanent copy. Okay. But, yeah. But the reason so, I put it on I put it on Twitter first is because I figured that's where someone's more likely to see it. Then yeah. I can't get them to my blog without them seeing that first. Plus, there's this there's a interesting phenomenon when it comes to Twitter and these threads. What I've noticed when I do a long thread, people tend to pick up on it somewhere in the middle, like a some key phrase gets picked up, and then they'll go back and read and comment mm -hmm. through the entire thread. So it's almost like you're you're peppering these these little. Uh, honey traps in a way, uh, trying to get people to uh, to just check out the entire thing. You don't really get that option on a blog, so, but you're treating a blog like it's an archive of those posts. Then, yes, yeah. The nice thing about Twitter is that you can, if you share a link to your blog post, you're only going to get to share one tweet. But if you break that blog post up into say um, 20 or 25 tweets, you then have 25 opportunities for, for them to um, catch someone's attention. Yeah. So that's the benefit there, yes. Well, and that is the name of the game, right? I mean, in, in terms of marketing, you want as many points of contact a, as you can get. So mm -hmm. having that out there, uh, do you use, so you use Facebook, you use Twitter. What about some of the other social media platforms? Um, I'm, I currently play around with Pinterest and Instagram, but it's just yeah. a, um, you know, basically reposting the stuff I put, put on Facebook. It's nothing yeah. really active yet. Yeah. I, I find I, I I'm I'm told by good friends who are Instagram geniuses uh, that I used Instagram completely wrong, um, but I do like using it uh, to basically reach both Twitter and Facebook at the same time. <laughs> How do they say you're using it wrong? Well, I don't do enough. I'm a writer, so I tend to write stuff instead of you know doing like trying to build out my grid for example uh make a make an attractive grid uh, i don't do the stories at all uh and i should we had a whole conversation with some some folks last night about how the stories work i felt very like boomer during this conversation like somehow i have finally reached that little level where i'm too old for technology <laughs> but i think i'm going to try out some of what they suggested I could I I know I'm not doing Instagram right. And I know I'm not doing Pinterest right, but I know enough about the platforms that if I want to do them right, I'd have to basically give up Twitter or Facebook, and oh, really? devote, yeah, devote a lot of energy to really learning how to use them. Well, and, that's what they tell you, right? That you need to pick the the social. If you're going to engage with social media as as one of your primary marketing tools, you need to pick the one that you know you're going to spend the time on. You know that you're comfortable with that sort of thing, and where your audience is really is the key metric there. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, in terms of your website, though, so uh, it's an interesting concept, by the way, that the the content you're generating is social media first and then blog. Because I I have done that, the opposite of that for years, and I'm, and I've always wondered about the effectiveness anyway. Because you you know you write this fantastic blog post. Then you you share it on social media, basically trying to get people to click over and come see it. But if you do it the other way around, mm. I, I I can see where there would be some advantages there. First of all, it's the content becomes fresh on social media, and they're reading the actual content rather than just hey, click this link to read about this. Do you th think is that effective? Well, 
I don't know yet, but I do know people don't um, really click links on social media. That's what I, I, mean, I found. They'll too. talk about the article, but they won't read the article. Right. And so that's why I started put, posting the first draft on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. And the other good thing is that if I make a mistake, say I give bad advice, um, I don't have to worry about I a blog post with bad advice is more damaging to, to my you know prestige than say a bad tweet. I go really? delete the one bad tweet. Oh, I think so at least. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, that is yeah. true. And, and there's a sort of editing process there, like a crowdsourced editing process. Mm -hmm. If you're you're posting that on Twitter, for example, and one line gets gets you some negative attention, you can just delete that one line before you make it a, a full blog post. Yeah, plus people don't really expect you to have every detail perfect when you're writing on Twitter or Facebook. Well, oh, that's true. You do need to have everything correct on a blog post. That is, that's a very interesting perspective on that. Like, I, I never quite considered that. I, I do a lot of, I've done quite a few posts. In fact, I've always felt guilty because I don't keep up my blog at all. Uh, like most my, like most writers, I don't keep up my blog. So, but I do keep up social media for some reason. And I'll write a post on Facebook, you know, exactly what you're describing. And I think the immediacy of feedback is what prompts me to do that. Because you, you post on your blog and you don't get anything for <laughs> for months or years. Actually, that reminds me. I I got my idea of posting first on Twitter and Facebook from someone who I've been who only blogs on Facebook. I actually know like seven or eight experts that only blog on Facebook. They do long oh, pre-trains right. about stuff. And I keep there's one I keep trying to talk into starting a blog post because this stuff is so interesting. And yeah. I think it should be recorded as a blog post, but he doesn't want to. Yeah. So, yeah, that's one of the great things about Twitter is there are experts that you know blog there constantly. Yeah. Um it's true, and it, you know, I do. In that phenomenon, by the way, of sh people sharing things that they have, they're not actually reading. Uh, that's also interesting because it it does kind of get you to a point where you have to, like, you're you're mostly reading the headline. I realize now that what what that phenomenon is indicative of is people are sharing the headline the same way they share a tweet. So, article writers, and I'm one of those, blog writers. You know, we have to come up with a way to encapsulate the entire concept in a in a way that's actually true in the headline. But mm -hmm. what tends to happen is we write those sensational headlines that don't give the entire truth. <laughs> yeah, but they are more fun. They are more fun. Yeah. The whole clickbait idea, though, that, that I think this idea kind of shifts that, puts it on its ear, right? I mean, cause mm -hmm. what good does it do you to have a clickbait headline if nobody clicks through? Mm. It's just inflammatory at that point. So, um, what are now you're on? And we were talking about uh, refreshing an author's website. So we've talked a little bit about uh, why it's important to just have one. Uh, and I and I agree with you. The goal is the is the thing, right? So, do you want registrations for your newsletter, or do you want sales? Is there a mingling of both? Uh, is one of those more important than the other? I think I would say registrations are more um, yeah. signups for the newsletter is more important. But um, for some authors, like for example, a nonfiction author might want to be um, hired as a speaker. That might yeah. be their primary goal. Yeah. Yeah. So that could be more important. Yeah. So as long as you know what that primary goal is, you, or mm -hmm. you organize the site around that goal. Yes. So uh, what are some best practices for web design? I mean, you're a design, a web designer, and you'll do author websites, right? Mm -hmm. yes. You do that for a fee? Yes. Okay. That's what I'm getting at. I'm trying to help you pimp yourself, man. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this as a favor, folks. Uh, so rush on <laughs> over to NateHoffelder.com. Yeah, I've been designing author websites for about three, four years now. Um, it grew out of, well... It grew out of my, you know, web, you know, tech support business when, yeah. and that grew out of my own my own blog, the digital reader. So I, when I started, I didn't have any money to hire tech tech support, so I had to teach myself skills. And then I didn't realize I should hire tech support, so I kept teaching myself skills. And yeah. eventually, I knew stuff most bloggers don't. Yes. And I discovered that by accident when, in late 2015, when I was helping a friend uh, move his site off of someone else's server because it, the relationship had soured. And so we just needed to well, leave as quickly as he could. Yeah. 
It, yeah. Uh, it's interesting to hear. There are so many like author website horror stories floating around. <laughs> I have one in my like recent memory banks because uh, we did a promotion over the weekend or over the actually is a promotion over the like, past you know 20 days and on the final two days uh the uh the guy was hosting with hostgator and all all this traffic they they freaked out on him and basically shut down his website and uh made him forced him to upgrade uh or they wouldn't allow any more traffic <laughs> this isn't something i think is a good thing uh so mm. <laughs> lots of problems there um so if I'm going to build my own website as an author, uh, what what do you recommend in terms of service? Because I know there's a lot of ways to, to build a website. Let's just assume, by the way, that I'm broke. I don't have a budget to hire anybody or to do anything fancy. Where would you start? Well, I would, if you're broke, broke, I would start at, say, WordPress.com. Yeah. And it's for only say you know thirty six dollars a year you can get your own domain name and the basic service. Yeah. Actually, I think it's up to forty eight dollars a year. And then there are any number of themes that you, what we start with is say one of the business themes where it's with a big splash um, banner at the top of the homepage and a button and um, see and that's where we put your sign up for your mailing list. And okay. then below that we put the intro to the author. Um, well, your author bio, and for that we put say images of your books covers with links to each um, book's page. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, that does seem to be where everybody starts. Word, WordPress seems to be sort of the online marketer uh, web tool of choice. Do you have opinions about any of those? I, I, all right, I use Squarespace, and I get flack for that from some folks, but it was. I've always liked it and it's always felt secure and it's always felt like, you know, it was easy enough to, uh, to build. I do some custom stuff with it, you know, HTML and CSS every now and then, but I don't touch it for the most part. So what's your opinion on Squarespace? So I build with work, WordPress, but um, Squarespace is the only other platform I'll work with because the smaller ones like Wix and Weebly, yeah. I just find them too frustrating. Although, yeah. Yeah. They're just, so one thing I like about Squarespace is it really is easier to use, and it's also the site themes are all very pretty. So yeah. you start out with a, a, you have an advantage because just what they're what they're going to hand you to work with always looks good. Yeah. That, that's not true with Wix or Weebly. That's true. I, I've always been tempted into just trying out like Wix, uh, just because they have they have great marketing. By the way, when you see mm -hmm. the, their ads, they make it look like. You can very simply design your site, just drag and drop. And uh, they make it look like it's just as easy as pie. Uh, but I tinkered with it like one time and decided that I really did prefer Squarespace. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I like WordPress too. I've, I've done a lot with WordPress over the years. Uh, it just seems like you can't escape it. It's a little bit like Microsoft Word. Like no matter what your life is about, you're going to have crossover with these two things. So you might as well have some familiarity with them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, what about like, um, one of the things I know has always been kind of a bugaboo when it comes to, uh, web designs, people tend to, they tend to grab graphics from wherever they find them. Uh, what, what do you recommend for finding usable, uh, graphics for your website? Um, I actually have a blog post on that and how to find them, how to find li licensed ones, ones that are free to use. Okay. But for a lot of mine, I just have a um, license pack for a site called Deposit Photo. And so yes. whenever I need to get more graphics, I just go there and uh, download them. Cost me about 50 cents each, I think. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a popular one. And every now and then, I think recently they had a whole thing on uh, AppSumo or something like that where you could pay like $50 and have like a year's worth of access for free or something i think it's a hundred uh, photos for 50 dollars, but yeah that's what yeah, I get some of those like often, yeah 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 so i don't go by me when it comes to that i didn't i didn't participate in it i just knew that there was a deal floating around up there so. can they find if can people find your blog post at uh, which are your, which of your two sites on screen can they find it um it's on my natehoffelder.com okay. and it's if you just google nate hoffelder and uh free image download uh, that'll probably turn up the blog post. Okay. 
That's how I find it when I need to share the link. Yeah, that's the same way I am. Like I have past guests on the word. So every now and then I remember there was a guest on my show on the Wordslinger podcast, and I want wow. to share something from that interview. Uh, and I the as great as Squarespace is and as great as the little search engine tool is, the best way I found to find back episodes is to search for the guest and Wordslinger podcast in Google. And then mm -hmm. I'll find it <laughs> in seconds yeah. rather than several minutes. Uh, those minutes are precious, man. You can't just let those, you know, just get wasted. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. We've covered uh, some pretty basic stuff. I, I, you know, what are some mistakes that you're seeing with, uh, with authors when it comes to your websites? Um, I hesitate to ask stuff like this because you've seen my site and I don't necessarily want to hear my mistakes. <laughs> Well, it's things like there's no contact info when, yeah. um, and there's what's say if someone well contact info is important if nothing else so people can point tell you that there's a typo in your book so you can fix it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Or um, say no, no, they have they forgotten to update their book of with their most recent release. So what, if I visit their site, I won't I can my, I won't find out if there's another book I want to buy. Yeah, yeah. that's just, an important one. Um, yeah. Even though you're you know as you say, and I agree with you by the way. I, I think for most authors, the primary use of of their author site should be to build their platform bigger, uh, get people on their mailing list specifically. Uh, so I think that's, that's pretty important, but you still have to, you know, it is still a, a marketplace of sorts for your work. So if you're not keeping it up to date, you're just really kind of leaving money on the table. Mm. <laughs> it's about, you know, relationships. <laughs> mm. So, all right. Well, so a contact form, uh, updated book list, Any, anything else that's sort of a, should be a kind of requirement for an author website. Um, you know, yeah. basics like um, where you're going to go for public events. Um, uh, yeah. Actually, I have, a, I, have a whole, I have a checklist on this and things to include. So now that's why I'm having, I'm not, but now I'm drawing a blank. Are you, <laughs> are you Googling your checklist right now to say so you can, <laughs> so you can read it off? Well, it's a PDF, so maybe I should just Google it, open it up, and then read it off. Yes. <laughs> See, that's the, that's the power of Google, mm -hmm. even live. <laughs> um yeah it, you know i always struggle with the like where am i going to be next stuff uh for one it can get out of date real quick i used to keep a running list of of two things everywhere i was going to be you know every conference i was going to attend or podcast i was going to be on or whatever and then i kept a running list for a long time of podcasts that i had appeared in uh or blogs or you know live streams or whatever um it kind of very quickly got out of hand so i would I, i'd love to find some way to automate that do you have tools what, that you use to like automate any content on your um, site no but what i my running list well for most of last year i had a running list in my newsletter footer of where i was going to be uh, wh what public events i was attending That's and smart. so Every time I sent out another newsletter, I would uh, remove any out-of-date events and add any new ones. Yeah. So it usually stretched out four to six months in advance. Yeah. Yeah. That's smart. Um, yeah. I uh, I should get back. I have a whole growing list of things I should be doing, just like mm. just like most authors, I think. The the guilt list is what I call it. <laughs> My list of things I feel continuously stressed over because uh, I don't uh, follow through on everything. <laughs> so you're uh, now when you take on uh, like the design for other authors, I mean, how are you, uh, you know, how do you handle that sort of thing? Like if an author comes to you and needs help building their website, what, what would be the first step in approaching you about that? Well, I'd see if they had a plan on what they wanted it to look like, so I'd have something to work with, and um, or if if not, I'd ask them if they had any design inspiration yeah. on what to give me an idea of which direction I should go in, and also what they wanted, what they're planning to do with the website, and yeah. how many pages. Some sites, some authors just want a single one-page site with um, with all their books linking to Amazon. And, that's yeah. not really workable. It works. Yeah, that that's about ten minutes worth of work, right? 
Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, well, no, I know. I joke, but I mean, you know, I, well, I used to do web design back. I no longer do this for clients. Uh, back in the day, though, that was one of the ways I had a, when I was doing like film and video production, web design was, was kind of how I filled the gaps between gigs. Uh, and it was still somewhat new. Like I was building with like Dreamweaver and stuff like that. Uh, you know, the concept of the, you know, of Squarespace or whatever would have just boggled my brain at that time. Some of those sites, by the way, are still out there and uh, they don't hold up great, all of them, but they, some of them are still kind of floating around doing all right. So, uh, so we are, we're at 1230 that, uh, central time. That's when uh, I told everybody, promised everybody uh, that we would start taking uh, questions and answering questions live. So, for the next 15 minutes or so, folks, if you haven't asked a question already, pop into the comments uh, wherever you happen to be. If you're on uh, Facebook, if you're on YouTube, uh, pop on in and say hello. Uh, we do have quite a few people here. Uh, wow. Well, we got some folks tuning in from Germany. Uh, there you go. So here's our first question you can answer for us, uh, Nate. So Vicky asks from YouTube, by the way. Hello, YouTube. Uh, why WordPress and not Weebly? Well, I like WordPress because you can always you can add more and more features. There, WordPress is great because there's a developer community and there's lots of companies developing a plugin or they're just developing a theme or they're you know they'll give you a, a small chunk of code you can use. Weebly is like Wix and Squarespace in that it's controlled by one company and if they don't want to let you do it, you can't do it. Yeah, WordPress you can do just about anything with it. Yeah, that's why I like it more. What do you think is the appeal of of, of tools like Weebly, though? There's got to be a reason why so many people are using it. Um, well, I like Squarespace because it's uh, it's so much of it's automated. So there's so there's so many decisions you don't have to make, and yeah. there you don't have to follow up with maintenance and so on. They're just going to yeah. handle it for you. Yeah, I do like that because um, I have had in different times had sites on both WordPress and Squarespace. And the WordPress one just, I'm going to just say, stressed me out, man. Like I was constantly getting these little notes about how there's, you know, a new security update or, you know, whatever. I'd had, I'd have mm. plugins that, you know, I guess something expired on them and they no longer work the way they used to. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Give, give me easy buttons. I like yeah, easy. I actually, I maintain websites for authors and that's one of the things yeah. I take care of. But I actually, I tend to agree that I wonder if they're overdoing it because, in a recent update, they added a new site health feature. Yeah. Only it, and they automatically added it to your admin pages so you can see it. Unfortunately, uh, usually about half the problems that they say are problems aren't. Right. And they're just just trying to scare people, I guess, or maybe they're trying to be too helpful. And, and, <laughs> can you be yeah. too helpful? Nick? Yes. I mean, you can be too helpful. Yeah, uh, they're adding the, yeah. It's it's adding to the stress by design, I guess. Or, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I could definitely see that. Uh, yeah, and I I do have to admit, though, uh, one thing that I do envy about WordPress is the sheer volume of plugins to do all kinds of insane, crazy things. Um, you know, we had uh, we had uh, Nick Thacker on the show a um, uh, week, couple weeks ago. He designs all his sites through WordPress, and uh, he's done some really incredibly impressive stuff uh, using third-party plugins, so... I can see the power of it. Uh, Rowan Denzel, Rowan Denzel, rather. Sorry, Rowan, I keep doing that, man. Uh, I love deposit photos. I get that deal every year or so. And that's the one we were talking about on AppSumo. Um, yeah, I haven't tried. I, everybody keeps recommending it. I know David Gochran uh, had recommended it, and I didn't get around to it. So, uh, Vicki Allen asks, uh, if I already have my web address, can I switch it to WordPress or Squarespace? Yes, you can switch it from one to the other, or and back, or to a third company. It's um, you just need to know you know where you need to point it at, and yeah, the, well, whichever hosting company you use will tell you um, the you know address to get put in for the where to point it to, and once you do that, you can it's done, boom. Yeah. And for the most part, that's not it's not an overly complicated thing. It can get a little intimidating and scary to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but you can almost always reach out to people that are providing that your that uh, domain name for you can can almost always help you with that, right? 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that something you do for authors as well? Yes, I when I'm when I you know do maintenance or when I do updates or set up sites, I I will oftentimes register it for them and then you know do all the basic technical setup to connect the domain to the new site and take it from there and then go ahead and build the site. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. handy. Um, Squarespace recently, and I, by recently I mean within like the past maybe three years. Uh, introduced a whole feature where they'll help you transfer a domain over to them entirely. So not only do they become the the um, target for it, they become the, the actual host for that domain. Uh, and there is a fee involved in that, but it's pretty, it makes things pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, and, you know, and there are some features you, you kind of get alongside that, like being able to use that domain for their, they have a built-in mailing list tool, which is very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so, Hannah asks, uh, what are WordPress plugins that people absolutely should have? That's a great question. Not that the other questions weren't also great, but I like um, it's a backup plugin, or yeah. I like to use Manage WP for its backup and update services because um, it's a good, well, it's a GoDaddy plugin. And okay. if you use it for backups, it stores your backups on their servers. So okay. basically, if if your hosting company dies, you still have a backup elsewhere, which is you know, great. Oh, very good. How yeah. do, where does, how does it back it up? Like, where is it going? Well, Manage WP has a plugin, and so okay. you install the plugin, you set up an account with Manage WP, and then um, connect the plugin to the account, and this helps start running backups and so on. Interesting. Yeah. I was not aware of that. That's very cool. Yeah, other important plugins would be a, things like a security or firewall plugin. I like all-in-one WP. Um, one of the reasons I like it is that it, you know, cha there are all sorts of interesting little subtle details about the way WordPress is insecure, and yeah. this one plugin will fix most of them. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. uh, if mm -hmm. you are, if you're missing these, by the way, folks, uh, this whole video will be on replay on both YouTube and Facebook. So you can go back, play a little slower, and write it all down. Uh, <laughs> so that's cool. Any other uh, must-have WordPress plugins? Well, I think you should get a mail uh, plugin like MailMunch for the mailless forms. Mm. And see, that's what I mean. There's so many plugins for WordPress that just make this stuff so much easier. Mm -hmm. And while I love Squarespace and they have a pretty robust offering of, you know plug and play uh, modules that you can use for this stuff. Mm -hmm. There's just some things they don't yet do um, that are, you know, just taken for granted in the WordPress sphere. <laughs> yeah. Things like a, a bookshelf plugin. Yeah. Cause like I like novelist. Yeah. And basically what you have to do is just give it the um, book cover, the metadata and the summary, and it will automatically display them on a web page for you. And oh, that's very nice. automatically build bookshelf pages for you. Very, very nice. Yes. Yeah. All right. It's very convenient. It saves you from having to you know, copy the covers to the right size and make sure the links work and so on. Yeah, it's very convenient. Yeah, because I, I, uh, one of the tools on Squarespace that's, that's somewhat similar to that is their gallery tool. I, I can build a gallery. I still have to manually build it. You know, I drop in the cover, the description, a link. Uh, I use our universal book links from Drafts Digital, mm -hmm. but... Because I have all that, it, it, it's in a gallery. It'll display it. And I can tell it how I want it to display. And basically, that creates that book page. So when I have a new book, I just add it to the gallery. And uh, it's all taken care of. So mm -hmm. very cool. All right. Uh, so next question we got is, uh, do your services include having a look at the existing website and suggesting design changes and or one-time technical advice? Yes. Great. I can. I well, I have an 18-point um, checklist of things to look for. Mm -hmm. Also, I have a different 15-point uh, checklist of things to look for. And um, I can also just you know talk about with the client about what they want to do, and so we can help them understand what their goal is and how we want the new site to look like. So that's cool. Yeah, that's very uh, that's very helpful actually. Because a lot of times, uh, even when I, sometimes even I end up sort of clueless as about as to what I need to do next, you know, like, or what I'm doing wrong, you know, like, you know, you have a, you have a web page and something has gone haywire. Uh, it's good to, to know who you can turn to, but beyond just the technical side of it, 
sometimes I'll set up like a landing page and it's not getting any traction. It would be good to have someone's eye on that. Who knows uh, what should be there. So mm-hmm. You're talking about that kind of stuff. Well, that's really more getting into the marketing and yeah. that's, I'm much stronger on the tech side. I see. All right. Yeah. Fine. Just fine. Well, <laughs> I could look and say what reason I wouldn't click a link on, on yeah. the landing page, but yeah. that might not always be helpful because yeah. I, I might not be the intended audience. That's true too. And that is, that is the thing you have to consider no matter what you're building uh, is mm-hmm. who it's meant to attract, who is this meant to work for? So, yeah. Um, that was very good. All right. This question is actually for D to D. So I'll, I'll field this one, Nate. Uh, does, does D to D do marketing? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, we will provide you with some promotion tools you can use to market your work. We don't do any actual marketing for you directly, uh, but we have some things like our DDD author pages, D2D, uh, our universal book links, uh, and uh, our reading list. Those things are all available for free, uh, and uh, you can find them. You can go to drafttodigital.com and sign up and see some things there, and there's also books to read.com. Uh, books number two read.com where you can find uh, a whole bunch of these uh, tools and if you're if you subscribe to us on YouTube uh, go to our playlist we got tons of, of tutorials and walkthroughs and things for how to use a lot of those tools so uh, let's see uh, here's a comment from uh, Twitter good that you reminded me about updating my WordPress blog hadn't done it in ages oh man that's dangerous mm. <laughs> You take care of that stuff for people, huh? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. Um, I can't stand doing it. <laughs> yeah, I run backups, you know, every day, and I um, uh, do updates every day. Oh, by the way, actually, I had a question, or rather, a reader did. Um, okay. Somebody asked me this question. They wanted to hear more about D two D print. Yes. So, so what's up with that? What's, so what's it's that still in beta? D two D print is still a beta program right now. Uh, what we did, we we kind of. We sort of paused on onboarding people for a bit while we took some of the feedback we'd gotten and and uh, shifted things around, retooled a little so that it would be more like what we intended it to be, uh, which is a service you know that that definitely serves that sector of the uh, author community. So you can now get back in, uh, start signing up to get back into the beta uh, if you go to this website at drafttodigital.com slash print beta. And we're starting to onboard more and more people. Uh, we retooled our entire uh, website, actually, in the process of how you go. You know, we basically created these two two paths you can take where you can go ebook or you can go print. Uh, so if you sign up and join the DDD print beta, uh, you'll get to see that. And then we're, we're plugging along. Once we've, once we've kind of knocked out any kinks, which there aren't many at this point, uh, we, we plan to go live so soon. I everyone get keeps getting tired of me saying soon, but that is the answer right now. <laughs> so, uh, we got a question from Roland here. Uh, is it better to have your author name as a .NET or lesser domain extension, or to have a .com that also needs to have other words like author or writer or rights? He said. I would actually like. I recommend going with a .dot com because everyone's just going to type it in, but um, by reflexively. Mm-hmm. So if you have a .dot net, they're going to still try to go to .dot com just because that's what we're all used to typing. Yeah. And um, you don't need to have writer or author in there, although it does help for branding. Yeah. I, you know, uh, Rowan and I have had conversations about this recently. Um, this idea of you know, occasionally you might think about not only having like your author name as a .com, for example, but also having a domain name that's a little easier for people to recall if they just sort of saw it in passing. Um, so, for example, I have I just recently bought uh, authorontheroad.com, which is a little easier for someone to to see like plastered on the side of my you know RV. And remember, then KevinTomlinson.com, which is a difficult name to for people to even spell, much less recall uh, when they're at a rest stop or something. So um, having a kind of a, a secondary domain that points, you can have as many domains as you want, honestly, pointing to the exact same website. So, Well, in this day and age, um, you're going to have domains on the side of your, of your RV, 
I think people are mostly going to you know, take a photo to save a note for themselves rather than just I'm trying to remember what, it, what I did. I okay. tend, I would, for this kind of branding, I would tend to have, uh, say, a memorable phrase like author on the road, not, not just dot com, but I would use author on the road because if they Googled that, that would bring them to your, hopefully bring them to your site. Exactly. I, yeah. So yeah, I, would go for, I, I would go for a memorable phrase before uh, a dot com. Yeah. That, that's more important. Yeah. I like I like that, and if you have the your keywords and everything are all set up on your website, that'll help people find you. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. Well, we're at time, man. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap us up. Uh, I appreciate you being on. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. Thanks for having me. It was fun. So everybody out there, first of all, I I should have popped this up first. Make sure you're going to to check Nate out online at natehoffelder.com and the digital the dash digital dash reader dot com. Uh, where you can get some great advice on uh, all, all things indie author related, actually. So, like I said, part of the nerve center, part of the, the uh, stream. Uh, so, and make sure that if you're on YouTube and Facebook, that you are giving us a like and a subscribe. That helps us out a lot. Uh, we hit our 1,000 subscriber mark on uh, YouTube a while back. So, pretty exciting stuff. Hey, we're going to go for a billion. Uh, so help us reach our goals. Uh, but make sure you're following us on both those platforms. And of course, make sure you are bookmarking D2D live. Cause we're going to have more of these. There's going to be another one of these tomorrow and another one after that, another one after that. It may go on who knows forever. Maybe So if you check out D2D live.com, you'll see the countdown to the next one. And you can find a bunch of past live stuff that we've done with great guests like Nate Hoffelder. So thanks again, sir. I appreciate it. Everyone else. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you all tomorrow for another one of these DDD spotlights. See you there. Okay.